Dr. Greg Jim, guys, I've got Dean Somerset here. Dean Somerset, super smart guy, really logical in his approach to everything that he uh, that I've seen him do. Uh, Post Rehab Essentials is one of his products, probably one of my favorite products that I've ever purchased. Um, if I were to sum up the stuff that he's done, I'd say from a logical perspective, he looks at it and he goes, you know, certain parts of the status quo are extremely good and certain parts of them need to go. And I think that that's what he's going to do. It's kind of challenging a little bit of the status quo, but we're going to get into more with him. Uh, Dean, you're talking to a bunch of people that they want to, they want to age well. They, uh, but they're not old yet. They're definitely not old yet. Um, they want to age well. They want to feel good and they want to live their life how they want, you know? So um, can you kind of give them a little bit of an introduction to yourself? A uh, little background on you. Uh, thanks for having me on, Greg Jim. It's definitely nice to be able to talk with like-minded professionals and uh, all the kind words that you gave me at the start. I don't know how logical I am. My wife would probably beg to differ most of the time, but you know, FT's their own, right? Um, I'm an exercise physiologist in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is apparently exotic for anyone from Iowa. Uh, <laughs> um, most of my clientele come from some type of a medical background. So they're referred from doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors. They need something to be able to get them to work on improving their fitness while still being cognizant of they've got a couple of limitations to be able to work around. Uh, I work with everyone from teenagers to 80 year olds, from Paralympic athletes who've won medals in Paralympic Games to Olympic champions to pro teams to recreational exercisers to people who've had joint replacements, spinal injuries, brain injuries, the full shebang. So pretty much hey. everyone falls under the kind of the same concept. So train with what they have, make them get stronger, make them get better, and do what you can to see improvements. And across the board, you can do that pretty easily with everyone. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. It's like, I'm kind of going, when you say limitations, do you mean that they have an injury, or do you mean they, uh, what, well, go for it. What do you, what do you mean there? Yeah, sometimes it might be an injury, or maybe they have a, a metabolic or a medical dysfunction. Like, I worked with a, a heart transplant recipient before, uh, as oh. well as have had like multiple heart attacks or strokes or uh, congenital defects or scoliosis or anything like that. So instead of it being like the cut and dry textbook fitness training program, there's stuff that kind of makes you do a bit of a detour or take a speed bump where you can't quite do the exact same thing with them as you would with anyone else. So you just have to be aware of the small variances that you need to know about what kind of red flags those individuals are working against and can we still see progressions with what they have going on. Yeah. And, uh, how someone gets an injury, someone has uh, something happen. Like how soon before you will start working with them? Typically it depends. Like if the person just has like a repetitive overuse injury, that's not flared up. We can usually do stuff in the gym that day. If they just smash their ACL out, they obviously have to go either through like surgery or physical therapy or rehab of some type. Typically my recommendation is wait until whoever you're working with in the medical profession clears you to begin an exercise program. So at that point, when they're able to say, okay, you can do an exercise program, they're out of the acute or subacute phase of whatever that injury is or that condition. Um, they've stabilized enough where they can handle a little bit more stress and loading, but they're not back to what we would consider like 100% function because I don't think that that injury typically will. And especially if the individual's older and they've got more gristled up tissue, it might be a long time before they can say that they're back to that 100%. I like that word, gristled. That's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> It has effective. You look at someone who's 15 years old and their tissues are going to be a little bit more uh, liquid based, whereas somebody who's 50 and 60 years old, they're going to have a higher density collagen in their fibers, uh, which is going to stiffen things up a little bit more. So their gristle is a lot and uh, better. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing seeing that, like appreciating the difference between those two, like a, like a 70 year old versus a 15 year old, just how, I don't know, pliable is the right word, but just how like their, their body's ability to, to deal with change and it's uh, absolutely amazing. Now, you've got a little bit of a different look on stretching, uh, status quo, like a little bit past the status quo, uh, where you're asking a question, should you stretch? Uh, should everybody stretch? Uh, and then, by the way, fl the flow chart that you did in the Cressy article, uh, genius, genius. Just so <laughs> for a couple seconds, I was like, oh, man. Oh, man, I've, been, I've spent way too much time trying, trying to explain something so simple. I, I wish I would have that years ago. But There you go, but, if uh, if someone comes up and were to say, Dean Somerset doesn't think you should stretch, what would you say to that? Uh, it's completely wrong. I don't think that you shouldn't stretch. I think that it's a matter of is it appropriate for the individual in front of you, just like with anything. 
I mean, a better, the best analogy I could say is, should everyone take a medication, right? Let's say that it's something like Tylenol. Should everyone take Tylenol or maybe aspirin? Should everyone take that? No, not necessarily. It's really beneficial for people who have high blood pressure or who have heart issues or blood clotting issues or something like that. Absolutely, it's fantastic for them. For people that have a little bit of pain or inflammation, cool, it works really well for them. For everyone else, they don't need to. So that's not necessarily saying you should or you shouldn't, but it just has to be very specific to the people who are doing it. So stretching implies a force onto the body. Is it the right kind of force that you're trying to train for, or is it something you even need to train for? So let's take the example of somebody who can do the splits, but has absolutely no intention of doing things like dance professionally, do gymnastics professionally, or be a martial artist. Do they need in their current Is it something that they're going to benefit from by doing a lot of static stretching? Probably not. If it feels good, cool. That might be something that's a reason enough for them to want to keep doing it. But if you have somebody who is trying to do a specific activity and they're tight or they're stiff and they just can't do that activity because the range of motion is limited, that's when stretching becomes valuable. So if you have somebody who sits in an office all day long and their hamstrings and glutes are tight as drum skins, if they want to sit in that position in order to do it, they're going to have to round their lower back, which means that their lower back is going to be under more stress than it probably should be. So should they stretch? Yes, absolutely, because there's a benefit to what they're going for and it's a limitation of range of motion where stretching is applied. So it's not something where everyone should or everyone shouldn't. It's obviously something where it's got to be the right medication for the right reason for the right person. That's, that's fantastic. I was actually cu really curious to hear how you would communicate to a client or to just anybody who's just like, well, should, should you or shouldn't you? You know what I mean? Like, uh, like, what, like what examples can you use to get through to people? But, and then um, can you elaborate just a little bit on the passive versus active range of motion? Because I think like a lot of what you're talking about comes down to, to deciding which of these we're actually going to use in a person that, let's say a person does need to stretch. What does mm -hmm. the active and passive range of motion mean there? Well, the best way to think of it is passive range of motion is how much range the joint has available to it before you hit bone on bone contact. So think of it sort of like if I straighten out my elbow, I get to a point where it hits a bony block and I can't extend my elbow out any further. So at that point, can I stretch further? I probably could, but I'm jamming bone into bone. So hard surfaces into each other. If I wanted to push my face through the wall behind me, I could probably do it, but bad things would probably happen. And I'm not to say that, you know, I should push my face through the wall because, you know, I like that wall. It's a pretty <laughs> wall, right? So at the end of the day, if I try to passively increase that passive range of motion, a lot of the time it's structurally limited. So that could be bone to bone, it could be joint capsule, it could be all sorts of funky stuff going on there. And when people get older, they go through degenerative changes, they get stiffer, they get gristled. It makes it harder to actually change that uh, structural limitation to the range of motion. Active range of motion is how much of that can you actually use. So if I'm doing a tricep extension and I only get my elbow to here, but I know that I can get my elbow all the way to here, this is my active range of motion, right? So I've got all this range that I use all the time, but I never get into this range. So I if I'm working with somebody who's trying to become a squatter for a powerlifting, the goal is they have to get low enough to get white lights. If I can't get their hip to flex enough to be able to generate that position where they would get white lights, then they're going to be a sucky powerlifter. They're always going to be battling and getting high. If they can get their knee to their chest, they have no issue with passive range of motion and they don't need to stretch it. But if when I get them off the table and I try to say, okay, now go through a squat, they get maybe three inches down into the movement and they stop because they don't feel comfortable, confident, or strong enough to be able to do it, that's a bit of a problem. Do they need to stretch that? No, because they already showed me they can put their knee to their chest. How much further into their chest do they need to put their knee? They don't. They're already there. What we need to be able to do is get them to use that range of motion from where they're comfortable to where they need to be to get white lights on the powerlifting platform. So we have all that active range of motion that we need to build. Up. And that's where things like high tension strategies, uh, working on passive ra range of motion, control competency kind of things, doing some PNF type of stretches, that kind of stuff comes really valuable. So it's not necessarily a, should you stretch at that point, it's do you need to. For the person that can put their knee to their chest, they don't need to stretch, they need to get more control over their range of motion. If I try to take them into that range and they get maybe to 90 degrees, they need to stretch, they need to mobilize tissue, they need to do some uh, deep soft tissue work, they might need to do some joint manipulation type stuff. That's where I tag out for a physical therapist or a chiropractor, 
whoever, maybe a witch doctor, a voodoo shaman, priestess, whoever I need to, that's going to be able to create that change in the tissue to help them get that range of motion. And at that point, then we start training the motor pattern so that they can start accessing. We're going to get off. Being you there, I think we lost Dean for a second. Ah, oh, crap. Uh, sorry, guys. I think Dean is down just for a second here. Maybe Dean is still talking, and I'm and I'm sitting here froze up. I hope so. I hope Dean's going. Ah. Uh -oh. This is va super valuable stuff, though. I hope you guys are enjoying this because this is genius stuff. And are we back on yet? Crap. Sorry, Dean. Amen. Oh, we lost him. Let's hope he comes back. Sorry guys, uh, that was he was on a roll there too, man. That was some genius stuff. I think he's really on to like Dean is a super smart guy, so yeah, uh, I'm really happy that he's doing this with us today. But hopefully he's back on here soon. I'm gonna check. Yikes! Dean, you there? Dean, you there? Oh, all right, guys, if you're still here, uh, we're just working on Dean getting back on. Uh, it only had to go to, Ed to Canada to be able to talk to him. So this is kind of interesting, but um, you back. I'm here. Are you? All right. I am good. Jeez. Sweet. <laughs> Uh, where were you? How long did you talk? How well we don't know if I was sitting there talking to myself or you were sitting there talking to yourself. Maybe then both of us. I think we were both kind of talking to each other, but not actually at each other. What part did you have me leave off? Like, what was the last couple of things I was saying? Uh, we were on active range of motion and how to get uh, if active range of motion is is lacking, uh, how to get uh, more of that. So we talked. Uh, you went into a little bit about high tension type strategies and then into some PNF type stuff. And I think that that's the last of my recollection. But okay. So yeah, essentially that was almost like the end of the point that I was making at that one. So uh, if you don't have if the passive range of motion, then you obviously need to stretch. You need to get that range of motion. If you have the range of motion, then you just need to control what you have to be able to do the stuff that you need. So it it's pretty apparent when the person has a mismatch between passive and active that you don't really need to stretch. You just need to do more control based type stuff. If they're literally not getting that range of motion, that's when you need to go back and start doing some of the joint manipulations and uh, soft tissue work and static stretching and all the kind of stuff that people hate doing but is valuable. Yeah, and is it a little bit of a situation like, how much is it gonna come down to uh, like a robbing Peter to pay Paul? Like uh, you, you go get some mobility and then you go get some stability and you go get some mobility or you uh, stabilize an adjacent joint or you do the antagonist versus the agonist sort of thing. Like, like yeah. how much is down to, to that sort of deal or should you just hammer down on on stretching or just hammer down on stability is there is the, is it real black and white or does it go for it I'm it, it's rarely ever black and white i mean a lot of the time let's say that i show a client uh, they don't have active range of motion we do like a high breathing drill or a plank or something like that all of a sudden they have passive range of motion and they can control it through a bigger range great that's awesome but that's really transient as quickly as it got there it can go just the same way so then it comes, okay, well, we got that range of motion. Now we have to train it to try to keep it. So the best way to think of it is like you got a bucket with a hole in the bottom of it. So you just put a whole bunch of water in that bucket. How long is that water going to stay there? Well, and we can do everything that we can to use that water or to be able to get it from point A to point B, but the, the bucket's eventually going to empty up. So then it comes down to how often can you refill the bucket by putting more water into it and getting that training stimulus so that it stays as full as possible. But at the same time, by doing that, the body also has the ability to adapt to that stress and get to the point where it almost self patches the hole in the bottom of the bucket. So you keep more of that mobility to yourself. So that's one of the great things about the human body is that it's adaptable to everything we throw at it one way or another. 
when you look at young baseball players, they'll actually deform the head of their humerus to allow them to get into that layback position over time. Once the growth plates fuse, if they've never played baseball before, they'll never get into a layback position like they would if they were 14 or 15 years old. Um, you look at speed skaters or hockey players, they'll actually deform the head of the femur into an antiverted position, which will allow them to get more of that skate stride versus somebody who's in their 40s or 50s. So you see a whole bunch of people seeing positive adaptations to their sport. You can see that in later life as well, but it takes a much slower time because bones and joints and tissues are much more gristled up and hard and they don't adapt as easily to stress as young kids do. I mean, young kids are incredibly plastic and malleable because of the fact that they're still growing and developing. The older someone gets, the less they're going to develop and less they're going to adapt, but you can still see some pretty meaningful changes in people. Yeah, no, um, I, I found it super interesting, the, the whole idea that I always wondered if it was kind of a chicken or the egg when I was growing up. Like, are baseball players really good at laying back their arm because – they were just going to be good at it or is it because they practiced it over and over again or is it because of how they grew up um and then uh I, do you remember when obama threw out the first pitch and it was just like dude you shouldn't have done that well i mean he played basketball so right. how often did you put his hand on that right yeah right. so uh, he didn't get the any, that uh the any version to come back and but then hey, it was than 50 cent right what's that it was better than 50 oh. cent <laughs> seriously way better so <laughs> So is one more safe than the other, or is it just depending on the scenario? Like is active range of motion, training for active range of motion more safe, or is it just dependent on the scenario? I don't think it's necessarily safe or not safe. It's very much like the scenario. I mean, if you don't have the passive range of motion, you won't have the active range into that motion. If you don't have active range of motion through to be able to control, if you ever get in a situation where you're put into that position, you're not going to know how to control it. So a great example that I give is uh, in Edmonton, we have slippery sidewalks because it's like minus 40 for six months out of the year. Uh, so if somebody's walking down and they slip on the ice, but they've never put their body into that range of motion where their leg winds up or their back winds up, something's going to go wrong. Either they're going to overstress a joint receptor or a tissue receptor or something like that and cause a spasm, or they're going to tear a muscle or a ligament or something like that because their body has no idea what to do when it gets into that position. You have people who are old and frail. Look at how they walk. They take incredibly short, small steps because they don't trust themselves into bigger ranges of motion. So it's not one of those things where it's more dangerous to do it one way versus another way. It's just if you don't have the passive range of motion, you just don't have the range of motion. Like joint control, end range of motion, bone on bone kind of stuff, you're limited. If you don't have control through as much of the range of motion as you have available, you're going to be limited again. So training one over the other isn't necessarily saying like one is safe, one is not safe. It's just, that's just what you have. You've got a capacity, which is your passive range of motion. And then you have the ability, which is your active range of motion. Have as big a capacity as you have and use as much of the ability as you have available. What, what well, is, like, I, like, I, like, I, but what is, what is it, is it, uh, is it that they lack the stability and then their body build up some stiffness and stop moving the way it was and adapted to what they were doing? Or is it that their body just uh, ended up kind of moving towards that direction just, just because of how it is? It could be one or the other. I mean, we're, we're great at adapting to what we have to do. So if I'm a letter carrier or a male person who walks all day, every day, I'm going to have a completely different set of demands on my body than someone who sits in an office for 50 hours a week. I don't know, 50 hours a week is probably less than many people out there probably put in. So if you think if you're sitting in an office chair with your elbows forward, hunched forward, versus a letter carrier who's standing tall, swinging their arms, getting rotation, you're gonna be in a different scenario. So if you want to get better at sitting in that chair, you're gonna to adapt to sitting in that chair, which means that you're gonna be favorably adapted to be stiffer, tighter, uh, lose range of motion, all that kind of stuff, because it's important for the goal outcome. Think about a specific adaptation to imposed demands. You're being forced to sit in a chair for 50 hours a week. You're going to get really good at it, which means that you're going to get bad at other stuff that's counter or counter to that. Mobility, ranges of motion, all that kind of fun stuff. If you've been doing that for 20 or 30 years, you become really well adapted to sitting in that chair. That doesn't mean that it's good or bad or whatever. It just means that you put your body in a position for 20 or 30 years. It's going to get better at that thing. If you're a baseball player or a hockey player or a golfer who does the same stuff all the time, you're going to get really good at the stuff you do a lot. And if you're constantly, consistently doing it over your lifespan, you're going to see the benefits of that. So that's why things like weight training over a span of life is very important. 
because it takes people and loads their bones, loads their muscles, gives them a little bit of stress, takes them through ranges of motion, teaches them things like breathing mechanics, bracing, all the stuff that's important to maintain health of a system, but also stuff like cardio. How many trainers do you know who absolutely hate cardio, yet it's massively important for things like, I don't know, your heart. It's almost like that's a major word in there, right? So heart function, blood pressure regulation, vascular function, uh, expansion, contraction, uh, blood vessels, all the stuff that's important for general health. Yeah. Have it in. yeah, it's all it's all in there, right? Like, uh, like I, I, some of this stuff is kind of funny because it's like uh, we can make it really complicated. We can like we, at some point it does get pretty complicated, but at the same time, sometimes when you step back for a second, you're just like, it's really so simple. It's really yeah. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you go down like the very specific biomechanical rabbit holes of like force vectors and cellular mechanisms and coupling relationships and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it can get pretty complicated. But what does it all come down to? Move, do stuff, put your body into a position where it adapts to whatever it is you're putting it under strain towards, and make it see the adaptation you're looking for. And when do we know? Like, when do you, well? When do you? Uh, when do you know when? Uh... When there's like a when there is that restriction that you should listen to versus when you should push through it. Um, I, I try not to push through too many restrictions, partially because I have no idea whether it is a certain thing or not, unless I've got like full records of the person's like x-rays, MRIs or whatever. And if I haven't received word from like their physio or their doctor or whoever to say, yeah, you, you have to push through this. I try to let the person's feelings guide what we do. If they say this is uncomfortable, this is painful, we just don't do it. Because part of it is I don't know whether that's something that's causing big problems down the road or it's also just not creating a pleasant experience for that individual. I mean, exercise isn't supposed to tickle, but at the same time, it shouldn't make you feel like you're hurting or that there's a problem going on. So if it's something that the person can do, tolerate, and say, oh, okay, I like this, this is fine, great, we're off to the races. And a lot of the time that might means me saying, you know, we don't deadlift, just due to the fact that that person doesn't deadlift well. I could coach them, I could work with them, I could do everything with them to put them into the best scenario, but if they say every time I deadlift, I hurt, Guess what? We won't deadlift. We'll find 30 other ways that we can get a similar training spot. Yeah. Wouldn't that suck? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been through phases of my life where I can deadlift either. I mean, if I've had a, a flare up of a back injury or uh, if I've had like a hip issue going on or something like that and deadlifting was aggravating it, okay, well, I just take deadlifting out and I do something different. And there's been times where squatting sucked. So, okay, well, I don't squat for a little while. So the good thing is there's so many different things that we can do that we don't need to do just one or two movements to define our existence. We're yeah. humans, yeah, put a body into different stuff. A little creativity goes a long, a long way, right? Yeah. Um, what about like physical restrictions, like uh, like an impingement, like a femoral acetabular impingement, or, or when we're going into, like, I see a lot of, a pretty common thing uh, in, is people coming into me after, after physical therapy, after a labral tear. Uh, in their hip or in their shoulder. Um, yeah. When do we need to, what, what are some ways we can kind of mitigate that uh, or that people can, can, can decrease their risk of having that experience? Yeah, um, part of any kind of things like labral tear or FAI or stuff like that is uh, that, that breakdown I was telling you about, if you get to the end of passive range of motion, you keep trying to go further. So hockey players are notorious for FAI because the skate stride is drive your leg up towards the midline and drive out and then drive back up, drive out while you're in a fully flexed position. If you just don't have the hip structure to allow that, it's going to wind up banging femoral neck onto acetabular ridge. And if you do that enough, you start developing a callus on the bone just like you were on your hands when you go deadlift. So if you deadlift and then you deadlift tomorrow and then you deadlift the next day and you deadlift the next day, your hands are going to be hamburger. If you're playing hockey, two, three hours a day, every single day, and just jamming bone into bone, bone into bone, just beating it up, your joints are gonna become hamburg. So what happens to the bone when it gets that bit of a callus on it is if it's not allowed time to heal and recover properly by not having bone jam into it all the time, it turns into a hard callus, which means now it's resolved and resorbed bone tissue. So that callus is gonna be permanent at that point, unless you get in there and surgically clean it out or do something where it's like, okay, well, you're taking two or three years off to allow that to heal up, which That's isn't awesome. very appealing for anyone, right? So part of it is understanding, okay, well, you're getting a bone-to-bone -bone contact callus forming. What do we need to do? Well, try to avoid ranges of motion that would put those two bones into approximation with each other. So a lot of the time that means no deep squatting, no narrow stance. Take your feet, open them up, turn them out a little bit to clear the space between the acetabular ridge and the femoral neck. Don't go to death on your lunges. Take a bit of a, a lateral placement element on things. 
Uh, if you have labral tears, then you got to be aware of what position causes pain or pinch or any kind of problem with it. Typically, it'll be things like deep flexion, adduction, internal rotation. That's also a, a, an impingement test for FAI. So staying away from those kind of things, putting the person into a reduced range of motion to allow tissues to heal, not necessarily to say, well, this will fix it. It's just allowing tissues to not get beat up and then give them time to regenerate without constantly beating them up and beating them up. So instead of deadlifting every day and wondering why your hands are turning into hamburger, you deadlift once a week or you do something different. You wear gloves, you whatever you need to do to make it so you don't beat that tissue up. So same thing goes with the shoulder. Take If you get into a position back here and that puts strain on your shoulder because now you can't control anterior humeral glide, okay, well, we don't put you back there, but we put you maybe here and work on can you get the shoulder to sit back into the socket a little bit tighter? So instead of having that anterior pop out of the upper humerus, you work on controlling that so you don't grind into the anterior labrum. Uh, there's lots of things you can do. The biggest thing is just understanding what positions are provocative for that individual. What's the ideology of the injury? It's like usually big range of motion kind of stuff. Take the person out of the stuff that's causing them problems, let the tissue heal, and then reevaluate as they start improving function. Yeah. yeah. When do you, uh, like, uh, like what? Right there, like reevaluate. When do you start being a little bit more uh, aggressive in this scenario? Well, every day is going to be different for each person. So you just ask them, you know, how are you feeling? How are you feeling after the last workout? Uh, show me what you're doing right now. Like, what can you do? Go to a point that's as low as possible without pain. Let me know what's going on. So pretty much every session with somebody, if they're coming back from any type of an injury or medical condition, is like a very brief reassessment just to see how things are progressing. And if one day the person's getting a squat to maybe here and the next day they're squatting down to here, okay, something changed favorably. So do we hammer that or do we progress lightly to be able to say, okay, well, let's make sure that we don't beat that up and have it go backwards in time. And it's one of those kind of things where, yeah, okay, cool. You got new range of motion. You're pain-free to a certain range. You, everything's feeling good. It's healing up really well. Let's not beat it up much more. Let's give it a little bit of time to adapt to it. But we might say, okay, well, go two inches lower into your range of motion. See how you feel with that. You might be able to accommodate six, but let's work on two inches just so we don't push you right to your limits. Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question. Uh, just like how far do you take it? Because I mean, just because they can doesn't mean they should, right? Yeah, and especially with stuff like that, like it's not going to be a light switch moment where it's like, oh, you're in pain, everything sucks. Oh, look at that, now you're healed, right? We know that there's a timeline. <laughs> yeah, there's a timeline of healing. So if you try to jump the gun and say, well, we're going to take you right to your edge, yeah. the body will eventually fight back especially when you push over the threshold of what they're comfortable with. And it might not be something where they know about it today, but tomorrow isn't another new story that they have to tell. And the day after might be something entirely different too. Like they might feel absolutely like gangbusters during the workout, but tomorrow morning when they wake up, it's like they're getting stabbed because stuff just sucks so badly. And it's not due to anything that they did while they were asleep. It's just that the tissue got beat up too much. And when they woke up, it was angry. Yep. Yeah. No, I, those are, those are the worst times when, like, uh, you're like, I did too much. Yeah. <laughs> but those are learning opportunities, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're getting short on time. Where, uh, where can they follow you? Um, and can you tell them a little bit about your, uh, your, your product that you have? The, it's 11 hours, hypertrophy and assessments. And uh, we'll go into it. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know better than me. It's your product. <laughs> there you go. Uh, people can find me on deansomerset.com. Uh, the new video series that we have out is the L2 Fitness Summit. Myself and Dr. Mike Israel teamed up on this one. I spent an entire day talking about assessments and how to determine passive and active range of motion, where body composition methodologies that work, uh, things like cardio training. Uh, Mike went into a lot of detail and depth on hypertrophy training because he's jacked and that's what he does. Uh, he went through everything from like cellular processing to training program design variables to nutrition to should women fear training for hypertrophy even if they don't want to get bulky uh, broke down some common techniques in training uh, we even did a QA and a at the end where people were saying who would win in a fight and uh, you'll have to tune in just for that one to see who would win in a fight no, that's a big question because he's uh, like uh he's probably got some size on you but you got some reach on him so, like, well he and i are actually the same body weight and he and i have the same torso length but I'm about six inches taller than him because I got longer legs. So uh, he also is trained in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I'm not. So so my big uh, fight move would be, hey, look at that, and then kick him in the shins. That's pretty much my go-to at that. Because <laughs> if he ever got a hold of me, I'd be pretzelized. Like I, I would have the labral tears you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Use what you got, you know. Exactly. 
I'm crafty like Ric Flair. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks for being here. I really appreciated it. Um, is there anything that you really want to leave people with, uh, just like simple like words of wisdom or uh, something they can do starting today just to, to get them moving in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, the best thing to do is just uh, do inventories of what you're doing and whether or not it works. So if you've been doing the exact same thing for a long time and you're not seeing, a, you're moving the needle in one way or another, whether it's a mobility drill or a strength drill or something like that, Ask yourself, are you giving it your best effort or is that even the right thing for you to be doing? If you stretch every single day but you see no change in range of motion, switch. Do something different because it probably isn't giving you much more of a benefit. If you do the exact same strength routine and you're not putting more weight on the bar, switch it up. Do something different. Like We're adaptable for that purpose. So you keep putting your body in the position to do the exact same things, you're going to get really good at doing the exact same things. If you want to do more than that, do something different. The body is always able to accommodate it. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. You're always going to get a result, right? No. Is, it, is it the result that you want? Well, yeah. you really this is this is golden. These are some uh, these are some knowledge bombs. I'm, I'm glad that the uh, audience here gets to hear it. So I really cool. appreciate it. You bet, man. Take care. Yeah. See ya.